Well, hello, good morning. Welcome back to the Alaska Sea Life Center for one more of our virtual visits. Uh, now, we're at the Sea Life Center, but uh, you know, we're actually close today, so I thought we were going to be out on the floor. We'll take a look at some of our exhibits up close. But as always, before we get started with today's program, let's take a look at the sunrise we had this morning here in Seward. Uh, now, you're not really going to see the sun in this, and about halfway through, the, the color correction really kicks in overdrive. You're going to see the sun like at the very last frame. So keep an eye out for it, just peeking above the mountains. This was running from 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning, and it's just about there. And it's just going to pop right in between those peaks there. We'll let it loop on through twice. So if you miss it the first time, there it was. It <laughs> just at the mouth of the bay uh, popped up for a split second there. So this past week, we have had some pretty cold weather. It's been snowing uh, on and off the past couple evenings. Uh, and of course, these clouds don't help with our sunrise, but we are approaching winter solstice. So of course, we're looking at an even later sunrise for the next few weeks here. But we'll let this spool on through just to the end one more time. All right, there you go. So that was our sunrise this morning. And as I mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at uh, some of our exhibits here. But as always, for these virtual visits, we want to thank our sponsor. Uh, and that is going to be Royal Caribbean Group which makes these programs free uh, for the public. We can just stream these on out, uh, and we love doing it. So I hope you're watching us live. If you're not, though, you know, go ahead and leave a comment. If you're watching live, of course, you can ask any questions today uh, in the chat. And then also we, we flash that uh, text number up for anyone that's watching live as well. And if you happen to wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, oh my gosh, I should ask these questions. You can either leave it on the comments of this video once we're done with the live portion, or you can always email us at asktuffy, that's A-S-K-T-U-F-F-Y, at alaskasealife.org. Now, those of you who have watched some of our other episodes might recognize the place I am, and that is because we have been here before. So the last time we were at the microhabitats, we were actually following around one of our aquarists, Leo, as he prepared the brine shrimp for the day. And these were very teeny, teeny, tiny little critters that we actually feed out to some of the animals, including some of these microhabitats here. But the microhabitats are one of my favorite tanks, uh, or I suppose they're a series of tanks, one of my favorite areas of the center. And I, I honestly think they're maybe a little overlooked by the public sometimes. And that's because uh, right on back behind the camera, we've got the touch tank, which of course we've talked about before. And then right on down this hallway, we've got the overlooked resurrection bay. And downstairs, we've got the stairs leading down to our underwater viewing of the seals and the sea lions. So sometimes people just kind of speed walk down this hallway. But the microhabitats have some of our coolest critters. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of just slap you in this camera here. We're going to make our way down the microhabitats and talk about some of the cooler, uh, easier to miss animals. And when I say easier to miss, that's because a lot of these animals like to hide. And many of them just have natural camouflage, where they're very good at kind of digging in. We've got a little clip of some of the critters here uh, using their natural camouflage or their hiding skills. So of course we have some flatfish uh, that just tuck themselves down under the silt. You might catch them peeking up. This one's pretty well hidden in there. And we're going to talk about those cool orange things there in this shot. And then besides just burying themselves, uh, as I mentioned, some do have camouflage and some build camouflage. So this chunk of kelp, this chunk of algae in the middle there, you might see it's got little legs, little pincers hanging out from it. And that is because that is actually a crab. So uh, it has kind of taken this kelp. It's uh, tossed it on there. In fact, it's called a decorator crab. So we can even pull that up because that particular crab one day was hiding in just the perfect spot in the habitat immediately next to it. Oh, we're a little out of focus with that focus. There we go. We got a chunk of algae. And then right next to that, we got another chunk of algae. So that one's the crab. You can see you know, it's got little legs coming out. It stomps around just like a crab. So that is a decorator crab, and it has a hermit crab on top of it. A right? hermit crab is just kind of along for the ride. Uh, but that decorator crab has skin that has like little kind of curved hooks on it, similar to uh, velcro. And it'll just grab stuff like kelp, algae, uh, sponges, sea sponges, right? And it'll just slap it on its back, and it sticks there. And sometimes we get these ones that are really, really well covered. We actually have a couple decorative crabs, or rather crabs that are pretty well covered, uh, that we'll be taking a look at. So let's go ahead and toss you in this camera, and we're going to take a look at our first microhabitat here. So this one is interesting. 
because you might notice it's only about half full of water. Uh, and we can actually pull up, there's a, a faster clip I've got of how we flush this tank out. So about half the time, this tank is filled with just half that water. Uh, and there are fish in here, right? So you can see this little gunnel there, just kind of peeking right below the surface. They'll even sort of touch the surface there sometimes. But every couple minutes, this tank will fill back up to the top. We've got a little in, uh, inflow at the back that's going to fill this tank all the way back up. You'll see right here. And it'll fill all the way back up to the top, kicks up a lot of bubbles, a lot of movement, and then it'll slowly drain back down to about half full. And so this is to kind of simulate uh, for these sort of intertidal fish, like our gunnels here, um, you know, what happens uh, as the waves are coming in and out, maybe at low tide, and sort of inundating the area. So let's see who we've got in our tank today that we can see. Unfortunately, like I said, a lot of them hide, but we have done some pre-clips uh, to be able to show you some of these guys up close. So actually, we do have some little ones here. These ones kind of creep people out a little bit. These are the gunnels that I keep talking about. And a lot of people say, oh, they look like a little worm. They look like a little eel or something like that. And we've got uh, kind of a, a clip showing some of the longer fish in here because, of course, we have the gunnels, uh, these worm-like uh, gunnels and pricklebacks that we've got in here. So those are crescent gunnels, the little orange ones. That big guy in the middle there, that is a black prickleback. Uh, so not actually uh, one of the gunnels, but he's big. And he looks very dark there, as the name implies, black prickleback. But when we really crank the light up on them, uh, he's kind of got a really cool pattern. I actually think we show that. So just sit tight to see that pattern. I'm looking around in this tank, by the way, while you're watching this clip, just seeing what else I can find in here. Oh, and I did find something, so we'll get back to that in just a moment. But I want to talk about the gunnels because they are almost intertidal in that if you go down to the beach at low tide and you flip some rocks around, you will just find them hanging out under those rocks, uh, even with there not being water right there. So this is that black prickleback. As I mentioned, it's actually got some pretty cool coloration there. All right, so back on to our camera. Right next to our gunnels here, you can see something kind of sticking out uh, from the rocks. Oh, and there's actually another fish there. This one I don't have a good clip of. So this is another prickleback. You can see he's got like a little ridge on top of his head. He's turning away from my light. He's like, oh, it is too bright. It's too early in the morning, Alex. Uh, but that is another type of prickleback called a coxcomb because he's got like a little comb on top of his head like a rooster has, uh, which is kind of cool. So I want to talk about this weird thing coming out from under the rocks. And we've got lots of them. If I kind of pan up, you got more up there. You got some way back in there. What are these? They're kind of creepy. These are, these are, I would argue, creepier than the gunnels, but they're still not really going to hurt us. These are brittle stars. And as the name implies, these are related to your typical sea star. Um, but they've got these cool arms that come out, and they can actually grab stuff as it swims by. Uh, these can be active predators uh, in that they kind of wait, like little ambush predators. And here's one that was exposed where we could see the center of its body. So just like your typical sea star, uh, it kind of has those arms, those rays, and then there's a little central disc. And those are the brittle stars. And we have lots of them. As the name implies, they are quite brittle. So if anyone has any questions about these critters as we're looking at them, feel free to type those in the chat. Uh, but we're going to scoot on over to the next tank. And this one's fun, because this is the tank that's got our decorator crab that we looked at earlier. And he's pretty well centered in the tank today. And I can get a good shot in on his face there. So you can see that little tiny claw. Uh, and he's got his little eye stock up above, and so uh, as you can see, he just sits there. He stands very still. Now, he's not the only crab we have in here. Um, as we saw in that clip, right, we have a hermit crab. Let me find our hermit crab. So this is a much different crab, right? This one, not as well camouflaged, and instead, it has to go around and find a nice shell. So uh, for anyone that's unaware, right, hermit crabs don't make uh, those shells. Those are old snail shells that they use typically, although they can use other things. Um, as long as they can sort of tuck their tail in there, they sort of have a lobster-like tail uh, or a shrimp-like tail, and they'll wrap it around the center of that shell. And so they carry that with them. But since they don't make it, they can outgrow it. And so you can actually see back behind that hermit crab there, there is another shell. Well, I'm also looking at a, a sculpin back there. 
Um, oh, the hermit crab's trying to hide that shame there. That's his old shell. That is the tiny one that he used to fit in. Uh, and now he's this big jumbo, uh, wide hand hermit crab here who lives in this shell. So as we mentioned, there are some fish in here. There's some sculpins. And we've got some flatfish in here as well. Whoop, there was a flatfish in the back there. But those blend in pretty well. I'll see if I can find anyone else. There's one cruising around in the back. And the way I can see him, even though he's up on that, well, he's moving, so that makes it very obvious. Uh, but you can see their eyes sticking up above the sediment. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on his eyes here. There you go. So you can see those eyes. Those are the easiest way to spot these flatfish when they are hiding, is just with those eyes. We can actually pull up camouflage uh, footage again here because I love these little flatfish, how they just bury themselves sometimes. And this one was up against the glass. So you could see they actually do get down under that sediment, and they just kind of sit there. Uh, and this one's not quite as buried, but his eyes are peeking up above. We've actually got some doing that in our next tank. So we're going to cut on over to our next tank. And we have some flatfish in here as well. Whoop, probably lost our camera. Give me one moment. There we are. <laughs> I managed to knock loose a cable on my camera. So there are some flatfish hanging out in this particular tank. And they're doing just what we were looking at, right? They are covered with sediment. This one's kind of giving the game away, though. Sort of propped up against the wall. Now, there's something else different about this tank than just these flatfish, right? We already saw flatfish. But we have not seen these yet. We did catch kind of a glimpse of them uh, in one of our other clips. So these are really, really cool critters. These are called sea pens. Uh, and we're going to take a look at these sea pens, because uh, up close, they are just gorgeous, gorgeous critters. Um, kind of fractal in their natures, right? All these little branches. Um, they can actually grab stuff as it swims by. And you can see we're going to get a real good up-close look at those uh, little grabbing bits on them. But the thing about these is these can also um, sort of tuck away. We'll look at that after this clip. But I love these sea pens. And I'm glad that they're out today. Because uh, if they weren't, then it's just maybe a tank with just a couple little flatfish in there. Ooh, I see a question in the chat. Uh, what is brittle about the brittle stars? Do their arms break off? And if so, do they grow back? Yes, so their arms can just kind of easily break off um, really quick. I, I do love this shot of that uh, C pen there. You can see those tiny, tiny little arms, speaking of tiny arms, uh, on there. But yeah, if, if you just want to cut on back to our main, I can answer that question about these brittle stars. Their arms can kind of snap off, you know, if you're a little rough with them. Um, now, that actually gets to something we get asked a lot, like, how do you catch them, right? Because uh, with these brittle stars being brittle like that, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be tough for us to just go out and get them. Uh, but we actually don't, <laughs> at least not on purpose. Um, because if we just pick them up, those arms will snap off, and yes, they can grow them back, but we don't want to cause that sort of stress for these animals. So what usually ends up happening is if we bring in any sort of uh, live rock, is what it's called. So a lot of the rock in these tanks um, is live rock. And that just means it's rock that we took from probably Resurrection Bay uh, or somewhere else on the Kenai Peninsula here in Alaska. And we'll take that rock. It's got stuff growing on it. It's encrusted with maybe sponge or kelp, algaes. Um, you know, you can have like barnacles and stuff on there. And somewhere in there, there's a brittle star hiding. And that's how we get our brittle stars, is by accidentally introducing them into these tanks. And it's OK. They're really cool animals. You just don't see them typically. You just see those arms hanging out. If we, if we look at the, the brittle star clip again, right, we've got those little arms sort of hanging out. And they do just have sort of the five arms uh, that you expect from a sea star. But they've got those little hairs on the sides of those arms. And they can grab stuff with those hairs. So as they swim by, uh, they will sort of grab on to the, uh, the food that's swimming by. Uh, sorry, not as the, as the uh, brittle stars swim by, although brittle stars can actually swim. Uh, and we don't have any good clips of that, but I do encourage you to look that up. Because uh, them swimming, they kind of have a little breaststroke to them sometimes. Uh, and they'll, they'll sort of cruise along like that. All right, so we have another question in the chat. Uh, what, what might you have heard of 
that's also related to these C pens. Uh, and we can pull up that C pen clip of the close up because it becomes a little more obvious that these are actually Nidarian. So they are related to uh, things like corals and sea anemones. Um, and like I mentioned, they could actually grab food with those little uh, structures all over them. And these are not the only Nidarian that we are going to take a look at today. Um, these are a colonial Nidarian, which means there's lots of little ones. Uh, when you look at those, uh, those bits out on the branches, on the feathers, for example, they look like big old feather pens, hence their name. Um, those are each little polyps, little bits. And so they will uh, use those to grab food, and they'll feed the, the larger colony there. Sea pens. All right, so uh, right now, all the sea pens are just hanging out, which we can see, uh, up out of the sediment. Now, they can actually go down in the sediment quite a ways. I've seen sea pens that are like five feet long once they come all the way up out of the sediment. But they're also really good at hiding. And this clip here has a couple in the back that are hidden. I, I'm doing like air quotes, hidden. Um, but uh, you got some up in the front that aren't. And so they can pull themselves down into the sediment. And in a looser sediment, you know, we have a lot of glacial silt on the bottom of Resurrection Bay, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a very fine silt, sort of like flour. It's called rock flour because it is actually crushed up rocks from the glaciers in the area. Um, that silt will kind of fill in once the sea pen pulls itself down into the sediment. The, the silt covers it up. And so they can hide real well. But here, of course, you just see these weird little, like, orange coins on the sediment, and uh, that, of course, is where the sea pen is hiding, waiting to come out. So we're going to scoot on to the next of our microhabitats here. This one's kind of fun. It does have things that you can see in other tanks here at the center. Um, namely, it has these green sea urchins. And none of them are really uh, up against the glass very well that we can see their mouths. But we do kind of have a clip here. Right in the middle, on the underside of a sea urchin, that is where the, uh, the mouth is, for example, on this. Of course, they have all those spines uh, that they will use for defense. And the urchins that we have in here are green urchins. And I'm looking around to see if there's anything else good in here that we can see. Ooh, up top, we actually do. I mentioned these weren't going to be the only Nadarians, uh, or excuse me, the sea pens weren't going to be the only Nadarians. These up here are actually anemones. Um, but these are a different type of anemone than we've got in the touch tank, although we do have these in the touch tank. Um, most of the, the anemones in the touch tank are actually uh, going to be crimson anemones or painted anemones. These are plumos anemones, with a P. Uh, and these, in particular, are white plumos anemones. And so these anemones will uh, basically extend themselves up, and they have very, very fine tentacles. I'll zoom in. They kind of make me think, uh, you know, if you were maybe a, a child uh, when trolls were around. I know there's like the trolls movie now, but trolls toys, right? Uh, they sort of make me think of their hair, the tops of these anemones. And they are very fine. So these are one of those tanks that would get fed with the brine shrimp uh, when uh, Leo is feeding them brine shrimp because they are sort of filter feeders. They're not like some of our bigger anemones. I'm actually looking further on. We have some other anemones in uh, about two tanks down that we'll talk about. Um, but uh, these ones are very, very limited in the sort of food they can catch. So we will provide them with the brine shrimp instead, which if you haven't watched that episode, you should definitely check it out, uh, because that is the smallest animal that we deliberately hatch and raise here at the Sea Life Center are those brine shrimp. Uh, and uh, you know we, we do use them around the center for many of our animals to feed on. So that's a great episode to watch. All right, I'm going to move on to the next tank here. This one is uh, a little different. But again, we have a Nidarian. Now I keep saying Nidarian. Uh, if you're trying to Google it with an N, you need to slap a C on the front of it. It is C-N-I-D-A-R. I-A-N, that is Nidarian. Uh, and again, that's corals, um, those sea pens, anemones, and these, which look like anemones, um, but these are actually zoanthids. So we can pull up a nice little clip looking up close at our zoanthids and see if you can spot another critter hanging out with these zoanthids. You're going to see it. It's one that we talked about earlier a little bit.
So there is a crab hanging out, covered in zoanthids. And he only really exposes himself when he moves. Uh, so he's got those on top. Now, zoanthids, again, are a stinging animal. Uh, these Nidarians use those tentacles to actually sting uh, and catch their food. Um, so just like anemones or, again, corals. And you might keep thinking, like, Alex, hold on. You're, you're talking about corals. They don't look like this. Well, they do if you look at them very, very closely. They have these little polyps uh, that uh, have these tentacles that come out. All right, so we'll go on back to our tank here. And see what else we've got. Well, first of all, there's another tiny little crab. This actually isn't even the one we saw in that clip. He's maybe only got one little xanthan growing on him. You can just see that teeny tiny little one there. Um, but, oh, here we go. We got some fish in here. So first of all, got this little guy down here. But here is the sculpin we're going to be talking about right now. This is a strange fish as it kind of hops along there. This is a fish called a grunt sculpin. And we've got some real fun footage on them because they are very cute little critters. And they look strange. They look like just a fish's head. Like if you just were like walking the beach and you found just like a fish head, you know, maybe you got people fishing around you. This looks like a fish head, but it's also got kind of like a horse shape to it. People ask, is that a, is it a seahorse? No, these are grunt sculpins. And they do kind of just hop along on the ground, but they will chase each other. They can swim a little bit. They got those tiny little tails. Um, so they are, you know, somewhat mobile, but they've just got such cool patterns and coloration on them. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't see any hiding right now, but these are another master of disguise. And I'll be able to show you kind of how uh, they're able to hide in this tank. Let's see what I got going on here. So here's one hiding right here. He's not really hiding, but he's next to the things that they can hide with. And that are, uh, those are, excuse me, these little barnacle shells here. So these are empty barnacle shells. And we've got some more over here in this corner, back behind our grunt sculpin. And you can see those barnacle shells have an opening. When the barnacle dies, it leaves behind that big uh, opening there. And believe it or not, but the little grunt sculpins will back themselves into those openings. And their head, as pointed as it is, sticking out of that shell, it actually ends up looking like a barnacle is still living in there. And so they could disguise themselves as barnacles, which is really kind of fun. All right, so there's still a couple more things in here we're going to talk about. First of all, I totally missed it earlier. And that's maybe just uh, evidence to its ability to hide. But we've got this one that we talked about with his one zoanthid on him. But right behind him, there's the zoanthid crab. Uh, just hanging out, covered in those zoanthids. So again, a uh, little decorator crab, that one. And you can kind of see the spines on its legs. As I mentioned, it is covered in these little spines. And they take those spines, uh, and they stick stuff onto them. Oop, no focus. There we go. Uh, but in this case, those little zoanthids can also just grow on them, because uh, they are pretty prolific. So something I want to talk about in here are some bivalves. Uh, so these are scallops. Now, my lighting's not quite right in here, but I have a clip of scallop eyes. So their eyes are very reflective. Those little dots, those little bright dots right underneath the ridge of the shell, those are those eyes. And so they actually catch the light pretty well. You can see them shining out. Um, and that is how they, uh, they can perceive some light. They're not perceiving a ton, but they can sort of make out shadow uh, or light you know, coming overhead. And so it does allow them to hide. They can close themselves in those shells. And we have quite a few little bivalves scattered around in here. Uh, and the thing about it is some scallops can actually swim, um, which is pretty fun to see them swimming along. They sort of just open and close their shell really rapidly, and it jets them along in the water. But these, these ones here are just being pretty still. All right, so that is this tank. And now I'm going to move us to the more traditional Nadarian that people are familiar with. So this is, whoops, my camera is not angled correctly. There we go. This is another anemone. Let me bump up the light in here a bit so we can get some of that nice coloration. It's got a real nice orange to it, but much larger tentacles. So these are the anemones people think of, like if you see Finding Nemo or something like that, where the clownfish live down in the tentacles. These are stinging tentacles. But if you've ever come to the Sea Life Center, you know that we just have these in our touch tank, and people can touch them. They'll actually stick to you. 
when they stick to you, that is them trying to sting you, uh, but they can't, uh, at least not the varieties we have here, uh, in that they just can't get through our skin, a little too thick. But the main thing in here I like showing people is this guy right down here. <laughs> so this is the scale crab. And unfortunately, he's a little tucked behind a ridge of sediment there. So we can pull up a nice close-up of them. This is the scale crab. One of my favorite things about the scale crab are those claws. A lot of people are kind of scared of crab because they can pinch, you know, they got the claws. But look at the claws on him when we get a, a nice clear shot of those claws again. They, they're like big salad tongs. They're very flat claws. And as mentioned, this is the scale crab. They've kind of got a cool scaled texture to them, but just such a cool looking critter. All right, so we've only got a couple more tanks left, uh, and uh, we are coming to the end of our program here. But if anyone has any questions, I would love to hear them. As we look at our last two tanks here, real quick, I'm going to introduce this. This is uh, related to our stars that we saw earlier, our brittle stars and the like. These are called basket stars, and they can coil themselves up, or they can really let themselves branch out. But we've got a real nice close-up clip of their branches, because they are just covered in them. And uh, as their name implies, the basket stars, they kind of got all this little curvature to them. So while we're looking at this clip of the basket stars, uh, do we have any questions waiting for us? Yes, we do. One question through YouTube came in. Are all the animals in the microhabitats found in Alaskan waters? Ooh, that's a great question. And yes, and not only in the microhabitats, but all the animals that you can find in the Sea Life Center can be found in Alaskan waters, right? A lot of times people come here and they go, oh, do you have you know, a coral reef tank, a tropical reef tank? No, we don't. But that's just because you're not going to find that sort of tropical reef here in Alaska. But we do have our own sort of corals and uh, coral-like creatures, right? that are uh, found in Alaskan waters. And so, yes, everything in the microhabitats can be found in Alaska's waters, and uh, everything in the Sea Life Center, period, can be found in Alaska's waters. Any other questions? We do have one other question. Okay. How often do you feed the brine shrimp to the animals in the microhabitats? Oh, that's a great question. So we can cut back to uh, the camera here, and I'm going to see if I can find... Oh, he's facing away from us. I was trying to find an animal that gets fed the uh, brine shrimp. Because most of the animals that get fed the brine shrimp are filter feeders. Now, I'm pointed at the snail, but I'm not actually looking at the snail. I am looking at a giant tunicat, um, and not, not a species of giant tunicat, but just um, that weird fuzzy ball on the back of this snail. Of course, it's not focusing on it as I'm trying to really get a shot of it. It is faced away from us. But you can kind of make out like this fuzzy pin cushion on the back. Looks almost like an urchin. That's a tunicate, which is another filter feeder. So we feed our brine shrimp to the filter feeders in these tanks, um, like the plumos anemones with their tiny little tentacles, or the sea pens. Um, those, uh, the scallops also will sort of filter out stuff. And so we'll feed them every couple days. They don't necessarily need to get fed every day, because we'll add food. They'll take a while to sort of filter that stuff out. And in the wild, you know, they're not just constantly, constantly, constantly getting food. They're waiting for it to drift by so they can filter it out. But that's what I wanted to show you in this last tank uh, was the, the uh, little uh, tuna kit that's just hanging out there. But I can actually show you. Let me drop my camera down so I can get a good angle on it. There is something else in here, but it's up at the top of the tank right now. So a lot of times people come in and they call our sea cucumbers sea slugs. Well, no, sea cucumbers aren't slugs. They are echinoderms, which means their closest relatives are like sea stars and sea urchins. But what you've got right in front of you, that yellow thing, that is a sea slug, at least as close as you're going to get. It's called a nudibranch, uh, which means naked lung or naked gill. Uh, and these are really cool. This one is a lemon peel nudibranch, uh, hence that real nice yellow color. And I believe, if I am not mistaken, right next to it, this over here, uh, are the eggs from that nudibranch. Those are certainly eggs uh, of some invertebrate just laid up on the side there. These eggs right there, those are some hatched out snail eggs, which uh, make an appearance in our touch tank episode. But right over here, I believe those are the nudibranch eggs. All right. Well, that brought us through on all of our uh, microhabitats here. I'm just real quick looking to see if I see any more comments. 
or questions. You got anything on, on your end there? Um, we do have one other question. Okay. Do you have to clean the microhabitats? Ooh, we do have to clean them. Um, now that cleaning usually involves kind of like scraping away. Um, let me see, sort of abrading away. We've got like these big sponges um, that are called doodle bugs or doodle pads. I'm seeing if any of these tanks really need a lot of cleaning right now. A lot of it's also just cleaning the acrylic on our side so that they look nice and clear. All right, so this is one of the more difficult tanks to clean here is this one, and even still, it doesn't look too bad. If I come down to the bottom, there's maybe just a little bit of stuff right at the very bottom. But that's because with the doodle bug, they have to kind of come down in there. Uh, think of it like a big Brillo pad, and they come down on the inside of the acrylic and they scrub it. And so this tank in particular, with that stack of rocks for all those gunnels to hide in, uh, that's a little difficult to get down to that last bit there. Oh, I actually did uh, catch another comment here. Uh, from earlier, they asked about those sea pens and uh, what species might we have heard of that are related to. They also asked, do the sea pens have a brain or any other neurologic bundle? I do not believe they do, um, but I am not entirely certain. That'd be something great to look up. Um, but the way I understand our sea pens is that they are colonial creatures. We can actually pull up that sea pen clip, I think. Perfect. So all those little bits on them um, those are the polyps. And so each polyp is technically its own little uh, critter, its own little organism, and they're all connected together uh, and basically feed each other. I don't know that there's a lot of neurological activity going on in those sea pens, but that is a great question. Oh, we just have a comment. It is amazing how many species in Resurrection Bay or their close relatives are also found in tropical climates. Very true, right? Like these sea pens, uh, they're Nidarians, as I said. So they are related to like the corals that you'd find down in Australia, uh, even though you know opposite side of the world, a much warmer climate uh, for the most part than, than here in Alaska. Uh, so people don't necessarily think that you're going to find anything similar. But yeah, a lot of the animals here in Alaska do have relatives around the world. And you've even got animals that can be found in a pretty wide range. Of course, we have humpback whales. We don't have any here at the Sea Life Center. But we do see them in Resurrection Bay, not infrequently during the summer. And those are actually some of the same humpback whales that a person visiting Hawaii in the winter would see down there. They make about like a 3,000 mile trek uh, every year, uh, or I guess, gosh, it might be a round trip. Uh, and so they, they're really traveling between these two locations. So Alaska, people come up here, they go, oh, it's cold water. It's not gonna have anything cool, exciting, or colorful. But I, I hope with these microhabitats, you've seen some colors you weren't expecting, maybe some interesting critters you weren't expecting. And I hope you've really enjoyed this virtual visit getting an up-close look at our microhabitats. Uh, and if you do you know, get a chance to visit the Sea Life Center next time you're on uh, walking around the floor here, please swing by the microhabitats and see what you can find. Because I couldn't even find everything I know we've got in there. They hide so well. But uh, I want to thank our sponsors again for our virtual visits. That is Royal Caribbean Group making these programs free to the public. Uh, we're able to just stream these out there. We really love uh, letting everyone see what the Sea Life Center has. And we know that not everyone can make it up to Alaska. Uh, maybe not everyone is going to be here anytime soon. So it's really fun for us to be able to bring the Sea Life Center to you with these virtual visits. Next few weeks, we're going to have some uh, guest hosts for our virtual visits. So those are going to be pretty fun. And I hope you'll join us for those. And then after the new year, we'll be doing even more. So thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week. And until then, have a great day.